Hello and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 15th of November and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 18th of November. It's been a fairly subdued week for European equity markets um, this week. Um, seen a little bit of weakness in the early part of the week over concerns that the latest snag in US-China trade talks might delay any potential phase one deal. Um, markets have started to rebound again on comments from Larry Kudlow, President Trump's chief economic advisor, that the talks, to use a golfing analogy, were down to the short strokes. Well, if that's the case, then most people in the markets will be hoping that both parties can put the ball in the cup because this constant prevarication that we've been hearing over the course of the past few weeks about whether or not we're going to get a trade, uh, a phase one deal, whether or not both sides can agree um, a common ground when it comes to agricultural purchases, whether or not China will drop its demand that tariff rollbacks are included in part of the phase one deal, um, then hopefully we can move the discussion on. As it is, US markets have continued to make new record highs. Um, fairly positive, upbeat comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell earlier this week, um, talking about the US consumer remaining fairly resilient. Obviously, we have US retail sales for October out later today, so that should give us a good indication as to whether or not there's any weakness starting to creep in there. But broadly, um, this week's move in equity markets have been probably more positive than negative, but if anything, US markets have continued to diverge away from broader European markets, which have more or less trod water. So what are we looking at going forward over the course of the next few days? Well, there's a, there's a host of central bank minutes due out over the course of the next week or so. We've got Fed minutes on the 20th of November. We've got European Central Bank minutes on the 21st of November. And we also have Germany and France flash PMIs for November. Before we get on to that, let's look at some of the key levels on the key indices. Now, I say we've seen some fairly decent gains over the course of the past few weeks, predicated that we will see some form of phase one deal agreed sometime over the course of the next few weeks and hopefully before the end of the year. We also need to remember that the prospect of new tariffs kicking on the 15th of December is still very much on the table after President Trump's comments earlier this week at the Economic Club of New York. With respect to the DAX, we can see that with respect to this daily candle chart that I've got up in front of me here, we're getting a very much a sideways consolidation above that 13,100 area that is, that is identified uh, by this horizontal uh, pinkish line here, around about 13,150, 13,160. Um, so still on course for further gains while above these series of lows through here. S&P 500 has continued to push on. I still have an interim medium term target on that of around about 3,115 so around about 10 points away from that as we speak and we're still well above the previous support area um, of the 3030 area which we broke out above um, at the beginning the end of October the beginning of November so there's a significant breakout taking place not only in the S&P but also on the Dow as well. As regards the FTSE, that's underperformed quite significantly over the course of the past few days, but it's still within the broad range that I identified in my commentary last week. The upside of that range is around about 7,400, the bottom of the range around about 7,100. I don't expect that range to change any time soon. So looking ahead, as I say, we've got the Fed minutes and they are out on the 20th of November and there wasn't much in the way of a surprise when the Fed decided to cut interest rates for the third time this year at its last meeting. 
Most, inve most investors had been expecting such a move, despite the likelihood of some dissent from Fed policymakers Esther George of the Kansas City Fed and the Boston Fed's Eric Rosengren. Um, for the last three meetings, the hawkish dissents have largely been dismissed. But what we have noticed, or what I've noticed, is a significant change in tone from non voting members. Um, certainly there appears to be an awful lot more discomfort about some of um, the, the more recent dovishness coming out of the Federal Reserve. Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic was recently quoted as saying he would have also dissented to the most recent rate cut if he had had a vote this year. And, and that would suggest that there's some Fed policy makers that enough has been done for now and we're not likely to get any more cuts this year. So I think the minutes on Wednesday will be very instructive in terms of the level of debate that was had as to um, what the prospect for further cuts was likely to be. Um, we also have the latest European Central Bank minutes. And Mario Draghi's last few meetings as ECB president certainly have been more fractious than normal. Certainly, I think policymakers have been much more vocal about their disagreements with the ECB president over um, the recent restarting of the asset purchase program. At his last meeting before being replaced by Christine Lagarde, um, the outgoing ECB president, re president reinforced the message that EU leaders needed to do more to complement ECB policy. Well, this week, German GDP numbers came in at 0.1%. Now, we were expecting a contraction of 0.1%. If anything, while those numbers were better than expected, they make it much less likely that policymakers in the euro area will do anything to implement some form of fiscal stimulus. What that 0.1% expansion does is it makes it much less likely that Germany will be inclined to open the fiscal taps and that I think in the short term will is likely to continue to be euro negative. Now we have had a little bit of a dip below 109, 110 this year to around about 109.80. The line of least resistance for euro dollar despite the fact this chart is very oversold. I think we're still very much in sell the rally mode so if we get any moves back to around 110.5 or 111 they're likely to be the extent of any rebound and there's a good chance we'll retest the lows that we saw in September. Um, Christine Lagarde uh, earlier this week took um, governing council members out for a little bit of a freebie um, to try and hammer out any differences. Well good luck with that because ultimately politics generally tends to trump economics when it comes to the euro area. So I think the scope for further ECB, ease, ECB easing while limited is still likely to keep the pressure on the euro. And that's when we come to the German and France flash PMIs for November. We saw a disappointing end to Q3. German manufacturing numbers still remain very, very weak and worse than was seen at the height of the European debt crisis. And there's rising concern that the weakness is starting to infect the services sector. So I will be paying particular attention not just to the manufacturing numbers, but the services numbers as well. France has been a little bit of a bright spot in the past couple of months. It has been outperforming Germany but the big question is whether that will be enough even of itself to prevent further weakness in the euro. Um, also got the latest Canadian CPI and retail sales numbers for October on the 20th and the 22nd of November. Canadian dollar has come under pressure recently, rebounding off that trend line from the lows that we saw um, back in 2017. And what's important here is this potentially a little bit of a bullish reversal on the weekly candle, which might suggest that we could well see further weakness in the Canadian dollar if those CPI or retail sales numbers um, continue to remain on the weak side, running into a little bit of a resistance around about the 200 day moving average, a little bit of an uptrend in place here, which might suggest we could slip back to around about 132 or 131.80. Um, in terms of company announcements, there's two of a particular note that um, I'm paying particular attention to. The first one 
in light of this week's story about BT Group and the Labour Party looking to nationalise the open reach division um, is Royal Mail because Royal Mail has been one of those targets identified by the Labour Party as a possible candidate for nationalisation if they are able to form a majority government. And I've been a long-time critic of this particular stock when it IPO'd all those years ago at 330p. I always felt that it was slightly overvalued. It didn't really price in the longer-term problems that Royal Mail was likely to face. In the end, we went all the way up to 600p, and we are now back below that IPO price and have been back below that IPO price um, for quite some time. The chickens appear to be coming home to roost. Um, I think investors have finally woken up to the reality of management trying to reform a business that has a highly unionised workforce. You know, the Royal Mail has to compete with the likes of UPS, FedEx, TNT, um, and all, all of those other small, uh, and all those other much more nimble private companies. It also has the difficulties of having to support a letters division that is in decline and market, market valuations of the business have always been on the optimistic side. I mean, obviously, management haven't helped. They've been very tone deaf with their attempts to make staff realise that reform isn't always a bad thing. Um, but unfortunately, in May, Royal Mail cut its dividend in order to free up £1.8 billion over five years as management try and deal with the problems of higher costs on its profit margins. In terms of revenues, revenues have been growing very, very well. The problem has always been costs. And with the prospect that they may well have to deal with a pre-Christmas strike, potentially around the corner, all is not well at Royal Mail. So um, this coming week, on the 21st of November, we'll get to see whether or not the company is on course to meet its profit target of 300 to £340 million. If not, we could well see further downgrades on Royal Mail. Going to finish up with EasyJet. Had a fairly decent run of late obviously benefited from the demise of Thomas Cook and the pressure on margins that will have eased as a result of that. In October EasyJet said that they expected headline profits to come in between 420 million to 430 million pounds with passenger numbers increasing by 8.6 percent to 96 million and that's driven by an increase in capacity to 105 million seats. Now I think with respect to this, obviously in October that 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 um, that summary did prompt a little bit of a share price sell-off. But ultimately, ever since um, the middle of the summer, EasyJet share price has been in a nice little uptrend. So the big question is, can they continue that uptrend? Certainly, I think the previous highs for this year are going to be a bit of a barrier around about the £14 a share level. And I think there are also concerns about, for me, I think the plans um, of CEO Johan Lundgren. Now, he used to work at TUI Travel, and there has been some talk that EasyJet intends to go down the package holiday route. Well, given the demise of Thomas Cook, I would suggest that's maybe somewhere you don't really want to go. Um, they've already paid £36 million for Thomas Cook's takeoff and landing slots at Gatwick and Bristol. Um, and I think the big question for me is whether or not um, Johan Lundgren thinks that it is a good idea to diversify out into that area. My, my view is that um, stick with what you're good at and steer clear of what doesn't make an awful lot of money. So Thomas Cook is a salutary reminder not to overstretch yourself and maybe EasyJet needs to remember that. Anyway, that's it for this week and today. Thanks very much for listening. It's Michael Hewson talking to you from CMC Markets.